Imagine a city so shrouded in secrecy it could only receive mail through a fake address at a university, a place residents were discouraged from using their real names and where no one was above suspicion of being a spy. We're talking Los Alamos, New Mexico. This wasn't just another American town. It was a military facility housing the world's most highly top secret and dangerous scientific research project. And the people living there were building an atomic bomb. Today, we're going to take a look at what life was like at Los Alamos while building the atomic bomb. But before we don the blast suits, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel and leave us a comment, letting us know what top secret government project you would like to hear more about. Now, shall we stare into the light of Trinity? When the U.S. government decided to proceed with the creation of an atomic bomb, they knew maintaining secrecy would be essential. With somewhere in the neighborhood of 150,000 people working on the project, physical isolation would be necessary. Eventually, they decided to place the research facility at a remote location in Los Alamos, New Mexico. Mail in and out of the town was heavily monitored. Scientists weren't even allowed to have magazine subscriptions because the military was worried it would look suspicious. The facility was surrounded by armed guards and barbed wire fences. Entering required passing through multiple security checkpoints, and every single person involved needed security clearance. Despite all this, the government was still worried. They understood that yappy employees were in many ways as big of a threat as enemy agents. After all, loose lips sink ships. Leaders would constantly remind the scientists that the things they saw, heard, and did within the grounds had to stay within the grounds. To really underscore this point, a billboard was installed in a highly visible location to remind everyone about staying quiet. It read, keep mum about this job. Very subtle. When you're trying to keep a secret as big as the Manhattan Project, there's no such thing as being too security conscious. Secrecy was vigorously enforced. Scientists were forbidden from telling anyone, even their spouses, about their work, and merely leaving the area would require authorization. One measure taken to prevent scientists and employees from spreading the identities of other workers on the project was to have everyone live under an assumed name. In this way, a scientist couldn't even accidentally tell anyone else who was involved, since they didn't know who they were talking to to begin with. Despite the fact that they were building an A-bomb there, Los Alamos was an ideal place to have children. Indeed, while the bomb was being developed, the city experienced its own baby boom. However, when it came to the Manhattan Project, everything was top secret, even the babies. So birth certificates from those born at Los Alamos during this period list P.O. Box 1663, New Mexico, as their place of birth, rather than the town's name. This, not coincidentally, was also the address used for absolutely everything shipped to the facility, whether it was a postcard or a ton of machinery. The librarian at Los Alamos during the Manhattan Project was Charlotte Serber. She had been asked to join the project by her close friend, lead scientist J. Robert Oppenheimer. Part of her job included protecting the sensitive materials stored in the library. However, getting the scientists to observe the strict secrecy rules was no easy feat. On one of her nightly security sweeps through the library, Serber discovered some technical specs that had been left lying around. She confronted the scientist responsible, who sarcastically retorted that there was no need to worry about this particular report falling into enemy hands because the report was all wrong. Regardless of her efforts and her connections, Serber herself eventually came under suspicion for being a communist sympathizer. In 1943, she was investigated and the army recommended firing her. Luckily for her, Oppenheimer dropped a power bomb, insisting that she could be trusted. As a result, no action was taken. Boom. As a fully functional city, Los Alamos had a school system for the children of those working on the project. The local school was staffed mostly by the wives of the scientists and functioned like any other school. But the school wasn't exactly like other schools. One major difference was that the children were required to follow the Manhattan Project's strict security rules as much as their parents were. Kids as young as six years old would be issued an official security ID so they could enter and exit the town. One resident recalled that the strict security protocols benefited parents. A parent who wanted to stop their kids from leaving the area only needed to take their security ID away, because without one, you couldn't leave Los Alamos under any circumstances. Well, oh, much like the Beach Boys song. And they'll have fun, fun, fun until their daddy took their top secret government ID away. 
To the people of nearby Santa Fe, the new military installation at Los Alamos was hardly a secret, and residents inevitably began to wonder what was going on at the highly guarded facility. In an effort to keep the locals in the dark, several of the scientists and civilians on the project would occasionally make efforts to spread misinformation. For example, remember librarian Charlotte Serber? Well, Charlotte and her husband, physician Robert Serber, once visited a bar in Santa Fe where they spent their time spreading the rumor that the facility was building an electric rocket. You'd probably think some local Santa Fe residents would be fascinated to get top secret details of what was going on at a heavily guarded military research facility, but not so much. Charlotte recalls asking one man what he thought was going on at the base, only to be told that he didn't care. He just wanted to dance with her. With so many people working on the project, there were bound to be some close calls. And there were. During one incident, the operation was nearly exposed by the Santa Fe Public Library. As is usual, the library kept a log of visitors who checked out books. One day, they sent a mass mailing to the names in the log, many of whom happened to be scientists at Los Alamos. This sent the military security folks into a crisis mode. They were baffled as to how the library was able to obtain so many of the project scientists' real names. Turns out, the scientists, who weren't used to living under such strict security measures, had been using their real names to check out the books. This was, of course, a major violation of security protocol, and the scientists were quickly reprimanded. The rules of the project held that residents of Los Alamos were never allowed to state their location in correspondence, except to say that they were somewhere in New Mexico. They were also forbidden from discussing how many people were working on the project or who any of those people were. Accordingly, all mail in and out of the facility was screened by the Office of Censorship. Many of the scientists involved weren't used to this level of secrecy and would occasionally try to find ways around it. Physicist Richard Feynman, known as the town prankster, would constantly look for ways to circumvent the censors. One of the ways he did this was exchanging coded letters with his wife, Arlene Greenbaum. To further confuse things, they would white out selected words and passages in the letters. The censors, as you might imagine, were not amused. Beneath the cutting-edge science and life-or-death discussions of morality, Los Alamos wasn't that different from any other American town. Dance parties were a regular event, and the facility even had a local band, the Keynotes. Square dancing was especially popular and was often led by the base commander himself. The town had its own theater where plays were performed and even a radio station, KRSN. One resident recalls being amused that the town, which was so obsessed with secrecy, never seemed concerned that its radio station was easily receivable by those outside the perimeter. Convinced that their efforts were going to save American lives, the scientists at Los Alamos worked long hours. The stakes were high, and the pressure was equally intense. To help deal with that stress, the scientists enjoyed getting drunk and partying into the night. One engineer recalls how these parties would serve punch that would inevitably be spiked with alcohol. Where did they get that alcohol? According to physicist Albert Bartlett, it was ethyl alcohol taken from the laboratories, and it made for some pretty strong punch. Building a secure facility in a geographically isolated location is bound to create a few complications. For example, Los Alamos, which was built on top of a plateau, was only accessible by dirt roads. This meant that when the rainy season arrived, the roads became muddy and difficult to traverse. The remote location also meant that residents didn't have many options when it came to shopping for the things they needed. One former resident recalled, you couldn't buy so much as a spool of thread on the base itself. Therefore, anyone going to town for their once a month day off was usually burdened with a long list of purchases for the others. While the purpose of the project may have been destructive and frightening, the area surrounding Los Alamos was quite beautiful. Many of the scientists who came from disparate areas of the country were taken by the scenery. Scientist Rebecca Divin fondly recalled memories of co-workers banging on her door before breakfast to take her for a morning on the ski slopes, a hike in the mountains, or a ride on horseback. Dolores Heaton, who grew up at the facility, recalls it being surrounded by huge mountains in all directions and described it as the most beautiful setting she ever saw in her life. For most of the project's duration, Los Alamos seamlessly blended the normal elements of American life with a massive, top-secret scientific undertaking. 
But as completion of the project drew nearer, things began to change. The staff believed their work would end World War II, and they took that goal very seriously. Work days became longer as everyone threw themselves into getting the bomb finished. Working to create the most destructive weapon in the history of the known universe raised some ethical questions for those involved. Many of the scientists were dead set against the military's plan to use an atomic bomb. One group even reached out to the government, pleading that the bomb not be used on any populated areas. Physicist Viktor Weisskopf later lamented that the team was never able to settle the question of whether using a device with such unprecedented destructive force was morally acceptable in any case. After the project proved successful in an event known as the Trinity Test, lead scientist J. Robert Oppenheimer gathered the scientists and made a speech. He told them, you are heroes today, but in a very short time you will be criticized for what you have done here. Despite the fact that their work would go on to end the war, history would prove Oppenheimer correct. How would you fare working on the Manhattan Project? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from our Weird History.